the main choice for this topic is that in Lebanon, where we are around 4 million, there are around 275,000 of migrant domestic workers. This data goes back to 2014, where we set 200,000 migrant domestic workers who are regular with registered papers and 75,000 who are in an irregular status, so who came or ran away, etc., and don't have their legalized papers. And these countries, as you requested to know, we are coming from around 13 countries, most of them coming from Southeast Asia and Africa. So we have the highest numbers going to uh, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Philippines, Sri Lanka, uh, Ghana, uh, and uh, many others, and Nepal. Lebanon is unfortunately faced with several bans, which makes it harder for migrants to come, and that increases the cases of uh, trafficking and smuggling. Lebanon, from our way of studying the issue, we know that this number that we counted counts around 7% of the Lebanese population, and Lebanon has the highest refugee per capita in the world because we have around 1.5 million refugees, Syrian refugees after the Syrian crisis, noting the number of refugees in comparison to the local population. But definitely the migrant domestic workers is an important faction and a big number that we are very conscious that these ladies allowed lots of Lebanese women to go into the work uh, cycle and that provided opportunity to enhance the GDP in some way. So the major challenges that migrants are faced with fall under four categories. The main categories are exploitation, where they are asked to work for long hours of work, not specified times for rest. Sometimes there are no mechanisms that prove that they were paid their salaries. Some of the migrants are not allowed to speak frequently with their families. The other category is trafficking. The third category is discrimination. One of the main opportunities today is that the current Minister of Labor is a pioneer in highlighting and saying that we want to end the kafala system. That definitely we could speak about it more. So he's saying that we want to abolish modern slavery and now we're in the process of trying to find an alternative to the kafala. Yes, they are exempted from Article 7 and the labor law. So, which leaves them without effective uh, protection mechanism. And this is the major, major deficiency in the system that any migrants faced with any atrocity doesn't feel really strong and doesn't have the legal protection requested to fight for their rights. We had a number of different nationalities and each of them were highlighting different challenges. For example, we almost had 50% of the participants that were Bangladeshi. And here, these women are largely freelance, which means they're no longer living with their sponsor. They've left the house and therefore breached the contract of their sponsorship in Lebanon and are therefore living irregularly without their papers in most cases in Lebanon, unless they have come to some sort of agreement with a Lebanese citizen to officially act as their sponsor and under the table be able to work freelance. To be freelance would imply that you would live separately from your employers and you would most likely work in a number of different houses. We had 30% of the women who were Ethiopian. They had other challenges. Most of them were living, so they were still living in with their sponsors. But they faced many challenges, for example, with the embassies. Compared to the Sri Lankan and Filipinos that we interviewed, mm -hmm. who had much more support and much more successful cases when they interacted with with the embassy. So here we see, for example, the Filipino embassy is much more strong in the support they provide to their nationals. The Sri Lankan embassy also is much stronger in comparison to the Ethiopian and Bangladeshi in how they support their nationals. Another nuance definitely that we noted throughout the research and through our field work would be in relation to the differences of urban and rural migrant domestic worker populations. For those in urban areas, particularly in Beirut, there's a lot better access to support. It's not wholesome, it's not 100%. There's knowledge on available services and access to these services is much better. Whereas in rural environments, women migrant domestic workers tend to be a lot more isolated a lot less knowledgeable of the support services available to them should they need anything. In general, the culture of respecting the domestic work is not really high, which opens this door for gender-based violence on several levels. Also noting that female in general in Lebanon don't have a legal protection mechanism. This GBV component, I think, that is tapping into migrants is also on a national level. Now there are big campaigns for Lebanese women to provide the nationality to their children which is not the case so far. So a mother who's married to a foreigner 
Lebanese mother cannot give the nationalities to her children. So this culture is not helping, the content is not helping for migrant workers to move on a fast pace because there is a need to change things on a national level, on a bigger scope. There are several categories of workers in Lebanon that are not subject to the labor law. Among them are the migrant workers and people working in the agriculture. So we definitely saw a lack of protection mechanisms and limited or insufficient access to these protection mechanisms. There were a number of coping mechanisms that women then resorted to to overcome this, which we'll discuss. So in the first place, as Zaina previously mentioned, I mean, those institutions that should be providing support, for example, the embassies or even the recruiting agencies, what we saw through the research was that women had actually, in most occasions, had, particularly with the recruiting agencies, very negative or even <laughs> harmful experiences with the recruiting agencies. And we saw in the embassies, as previously mentioned, that actually the support provided here was not sufficient as it should be. There are numerous examples of this. It's one of the biggest challenges in accessing support in cases of violence would be a lack of knowledge on available services. And then in the second place, the safe ability to access these. We heard many cases of women that due to a lack of communication with the external world and through restrictions on their freedom of mobility, freedom of movement, they were unable to access these services even in the cases that they did know about them. So even when they were aware of the services, they were often not accessing them. Thirdly, the women highlighted, which was of great concern to, to us as an organization, as a researchers, that they didn't access services in many cases or complaint mechanisms because they didn't think that they would be listened to. We heard numerous accounts of women saying, well, what's the point of me going? They won't listen to me. They don't listen to us. They only listen to the Lebanese. And many women said that if they had a problem or if they saw another migrant worker, having a problem, they would not report it. Firstly, they said that in their countries of origin, they had much more trust in reporting these things, much more trust in the authorities, for example, and they would approach them and they believed that they would be listened to. Another restriction, a barrier on accessing the support was the legal status in the country. As Zena was saying, particularly with the freelancers, there are many women, domestic workers, working as freelancers, so who've broken the contracts as it currently stands, that would not have their legal status in the country and highlighted very much that they feared being detained or deported if they were to access um, support services in cases of abuse. So actually, to be honest, in most cases, we saw that women were using social networks and a small number of NGOs in cases of abuse. So it was very much that they, particularly those women that did have access to communication channels, it's very much a different story when the migrant domestic worker has limited access to a phone or to a computer, to social media. Because in cases that she did, we saw very much that they would rely on these social networks and they would feel safe to come to NGOs as well.